Thank you all very much for coming. I apologize for being 10 minutes late. Uh, you are at the seminar uh, presented by Audium on interactive streaming, mechanical royalties, how that works, why you are or are not getting paid, how to fix that problem. That's going to be from 11 to 12.30, then pizza, drinks, then from 1 to 2.30, uh, we'll be doing a seminar presentation on YouTube, the intricacies of that, how it all works, how you get paid, and so forth. For those of you not able to attend, the pizza's freaking awesome, so I'm sorry. Um, my name is Jeff Price. Quick background on myself. Ran a record label called Spin Art Records for about 17 and a half years. Put out bands like the Echo and the Bunnymen, the Pixies, Apples and Stereo, Clem Snide, Richard Thompson, and probably 220 other artists you've never heard of. In the mid-90s, early mid-90s, 96, I helped to launch a company called eMusic, which was the first online digital music service. Uh, it was during the dot-com boom. That was a, a hell of an education. Um, anyway, move forward in time. 2005, as my record label went down in a ball of flames, I came up with this idea for a company called TuneCore, and then I launched that, and TuneCore allowed artists that controlled rights to their sound recordings to have access to global distribution, put their music onto the shelves of the stores where people could go to buy it, keep their copyrights, and when the music sold, get 100% of the revenue for a simple flat fee. So sort of democratize the industry, let everybody in. Uh, the constituency of TuneCore went on to sell over, at this point, over a billion units of music. They've generated gross music sales of over $750 million. This is the everybody else. The market share of the company is about the size of EMI by the time I got pushed out by the venture capital group. And about four and a half years into it, I began to wonder about the additional money that the customers made. Uh, the customers of the service, or what we call self-published songwriters, and I'll get into that in a moment, but it, they had generated an additional hundred million dollars from the sale of their music, but they hadn't been paid the money, and I wanted to figure out why. And then I launched a global, what's called publishing administration service, which I'll get into in a little bit. And then, yeah, the, uh, the institutional venture capital group uh, pushed myself, the other founders out, learned a valuable lesson about that, began to consult for the Canadian performing rights organization called SOCAN, and did that for two years with the CEO, COO, and came up with an idea for Audium, which gets songwriters, publishers, labels, artists paid for the digital use of their music. And that's a quick background on myself. I wanted to thank, if Tom Truitt's not here yet, Tom Truitt had an event last night called Who Knew? It was the first version of this thing. He had, I think, six of us speaking for 10 minutes each to a crowd of people, the room was packed, and we each got 10 minutes to present something that you weren't supposed to know. You know, beyond I have a mole in my ass. So, uh, oh wait, I'm, I'm not supposed to say that here. Beyond I have a mole on my cheek. Okay, so uh, in any event, and I just wanted to thank him. It was great, and he helped market and promote this event, and thank you guys for helping to film it. Okay, so with that being said, I wanted to move into this. And again, if you have questions, please ask them as I go through this. If we have a second mic, dare I ask, uh, it'd be great so we can hand it over to them. If not, we'll, I'll either repeat the question back for the camera or we'll hand the mic over to you. So, with that said, let me roll into the six legal copyrights. So, we have a room full of a variety of different people. We have more experienced music publishers, we have publishing administrators, we have artists, we have students, um, and management companies, and so forth. So, I want to define terms for everyone before we move forward, and I'll try to find that blend of not too, too high, not too low. Vodka. So, Three, th three words I want to make sure we're all in sync on. The first one is songwriter, publisher, or first three, songwriter, publisher, publishing administrator. Because if I use those words, this is how I'm defining them today. You may or may not agree, but just for sake of clarity in this room. If you wrote a song called, look at the guy that looks like Ray Romano. Okay, that went over well. And, uh, what? and um, you recorded it and it got commercially distributed. Let's say it was available on iTunes. You are the songwriter because you wrote the song. You are the publisher because you own the copyright to the song. And you also are the publishing administrator because you get signing power. You get to say yes, you get to say no. So your three things, songwriter, publisher, publishing administrator. And very quickly to explain how these things work, you could, if you like, enter into a deal with, let's say, me. And I'd say, I like to take over the signing power of your 
composition, your song. And in that case, what would happen is you're still the songwriter, you're still the publisher, but now I get to have signing power on your behalf. I take on the responsibilities of all the things that come with that creation of what's called a composition, a lyric and melody. It's called a composition. Uh, something else you could do is I could buy it from you. I could pay you money or you could just really like me and just give it to me, in which case you are still the songwriter, but you would no longer be a publisher or a publishing administrator. Or we could co-publish it where you own a piece and I own a piece, but I also get to call the shots as the publishing administrator. So did that make sense? Okay, cool. Three things so you should know. The second thing is I'm going to use the word composition. A composition is a lyric and a melody, just a vernacular term that we use in the industry. So if you write a song and has a lyric and or a melody, that is called a composition in the music industry, and music publishing has to do with songwriter, publishing, publishing administrator. Because we have to have, use lots of jargon. When you create a song in your head, it is not tangible. It only becomes tangible when you either write it down or record it. And as soon as you do that, when you write it down or record it, you get those. You don't have to do anything else. In the United States, the minute a song becomes tangible, meaning you've written it down or you've recorded it, you get, I call them six copyrights. It's kind of six slices of copyright. You get the right of reproduction, the right of distribution, the right of derivatives, the right of public display, the right of distribution. Did I do that one twice? I did, sorry. The right of digital transmission. I decided like 20 minutes before to pound together a PowerPoint. What am I missing? Those reproduction, distribution, derivatives, plug okay, screw it. We're just, we'll just, just ignore this for the moment. It is six. So, yeah, thank you. Pu did I miss public performance? Oh, dude, that's a big one, yeah. This, so this public, thank you, public performance. Reproduction, distribution, derivatives, public display, public performance, and digital transmission. I could go correct it right now. Uh, you know what? When we do in post, I'm going to send you the corrected version. Rock on. Okay, so those are the six copyrights you get the minute you make it tangible. So you've got these six copyrights. Now, one of the things that you do, now that you've got these six copyrights, is you have to police and enforce these and license and collect off of all of them. Each one kind of works differently than the other. I'm going to focus in today on primarily the one I didn't write down, which is public performance, and reproduction, which is the sexiest, um, because those are the ones that, in my opinion, uh, technology has really impacted and caused a huge growth in. And I'm going to focus in right now on the right of reproduction because that ties into something called mechanical royalties. Now, mechanical royalties has a, uh, a legacy in piano rolls, and it's a term that's used that says every time your song, your lyric and melody is reproduced, you are supposed to be paid, unless you want to waive that right. Is that making sense so far? All right. And very quickly, before we go through this, distribution has to do with the distribution of a sound recording, which is embodying a composition. Uh, derivatives is sampling or, you know, can't touch this, no, 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 no. Right, that's it, that's a form of derivative, or translation into another language, if you've ever seen The Big Lebowski, and John Turturro's licking that bowling ball, or about to, and they do a, uh, Gypsy Kings are doing a version of Hotel California, that's a derivative work because it's in another language. Uh, the night the lights went out in Georgia, song from, my, from the 70s, Vicki Lawrence, uh, if that got turned into a ABC movie, that would be a derivative work. So a song being put into a movie, okay. Uh, public display are lyrics. Believe it or not, no one can put your lyrics up on the internet without a license from you. If they are, they're infringing on your copyright. Uh, distribution, AKA public performance, it has to do with the public performance of your lyric and melody. The radio, television, uh, music playing in a bar, a gym, a health club, an elevator, a ringtone, a ringback tone, a stream on the internet are all forms of public performances and those are supposed to be licensed and paid on. And digital transmissions has to do with things like Pandora and the new ways that we cons consumers listen to, listens to music digitally through cable, satellite, uh, LGE networks, and so forth. Right. But I'm going to really focus right now on the right of reproduction. So what is a reproduction, in this case, a mechanical royalty? Because there's, there's literally there's two slices of reproduction that people talk about a lot. One of them I will not be discussing today, except for right now, very quickly, is the right of synchronization. So what happens is if I have a new movie, I'm Steven Spielberg, I'll put E.T. 2, he's back, with a vengeance. Uh, and I want to put a song that you wrote into the movie that you recorded. I need a license from you to synchronize the 
composition and the sound recording to a moving image. And that's part of the right of reproduction. It's a sync license. The other part of it is a mechanical royalty. And this has to do when your song is reproduced in specific ways. So what are types of reproductions? Well, in the physical world, it would be when you manufactured a piece of vinyl. So again, you've written a song, either you've recorded it or somebody else did. I make a seven inch vinyl single, it's been reproduced. A mechanical royalty is now owed, and I'll get into how that works in a second. Same thing with a CD, a cassette, eight track, anything else you can think of. That is considered a reproduction. And the way that works is the United States government, and this sort of blows my mind, metaphorically walks into your home as a publisher, as a publishing administrator or a songwriter, and takes away your right to choice. You have no choice to say no. We are going to compel you, metaphorically put a gun to your head, to allow other people to use your work whether you like it or not. We are one of the only countries in the world, by the way, to do this, where you do not have the right, after you've commercially released a sound recording of your composition, to say no. I happen to think that's insane. Uh, I happen to think that a an artist or a songwriter should have the ability to control their work and say yes or say no. But in the United States, you can't. And the argument around that has to do with creativity and innovation and, and copyright benefiting the public good. All I can tell you is the British invasion didn't happen here. Right? The Beatles aren't American. So I, I don't see it happening, but nevertheless, that's the way we work. And the way this, this, this law, it's called a compulsory license. They compel you to have to license. So until you have your lyric and melody released commercially, which of course now is a blurred line, you do not have the compulsory license. You can say no. If you write a lyric and melody and it's never been released, it's not available on iTunes, and I want to record it, you can negotiate anything you want. But the minute it becomes available, it's been distributed, it's out there in the world, it's commercially available, You've lost the right to say no. You've lost the right to negotiate how much you get paid and the rules around it through something called the compulsory license. And the compulsory license compels you to have to allow the neo-Nazi hate band or the, the lovely group of clowns or Mitt Romney to re cover your song. You can't say no, provided the entity that is covering your song follows some rules. Right? And the rules, it's, this is section 115 if I remember correctly, the copyright law. And the rules say this, you know, I'm gonna just scrunch them down very quickly. Number one, the amount of money you get paid, you don't get to dictate that other, other either, there we go. Uh, so much for free market value, right? You get no say in how much you get paid. The government through the copyright board, it's called the CRB, uh, meets I believe once every three or five years and they discuss what this rate should be. It's called the statutory rate. Compulsory license with a statutory rate. And the amount right now is 9.1 cents, a little less than a dime, for a song that runs under five minutes. If it runs over five minutes, it turns into a formula, I believe it's 1.74 cents per minute. So that's the rate, right? So if you write a song, it's under five minutes, you record it, it goes up in iTunes, it gets down, sorry, it gets put onto a piece of vinyl, that reproduction now in today's world, you're owed 9.1 cents under the compulsory license. So much you get paid. So the next thing, though, is they don't just get the license. Actually, they actually have to do something to get the license. But the thing they have to do is called a notice of intent. And what that means is you literally get something that says, hey, dude, I'm going to notify you that I intend, they actually legally have to put the word dude in there, that I, I'm going to intend to, to put your sound recording and manufacture it and commercially release it on this piece of vinyl. That is called an NOI, Notice of Intent. And if you receive that Notice of Intent, they have a license. So, they manufacture it, whether they sell it or not is irrelevant under the compulsory license. If they manufacture one million CDs, one million pieces of vinyl, and none of them sell, it doesn't matter, you're still owed Technically, under that law, 9.1 cents currently for each piece of vinyl that's been manufactured with your recording of your song on it. So if you've written 10 songs and all 10 songs get recorded, then it's 10 times 9.1 cents. And that's the way that works. So the world of physical, as you can imagine, particularly for the publishing administrator, because remember, the publishing administrator has the signing power, 
is the entity that collects the money that comes in. They had a really hard task in front of them because if I was to manufacture at Sun Records uh, Hound Dog or whatever it is, how do you know how many copies I manufactured to make sure you're getting paid accurately? Right? Nobody really knew. Uh, the rate, by the way, was much different back then. and it, There was a change in the early 70s in the way it was calculated. There's pre-1972 and post-72 rates, but I'll keep this thing as simple as I can. Along comes something called SoundScan in the early 1990s. And SoundScan, back in the days when we would walk naked, uphill, barefoot both ways, and had our horse and buggies to go to Tower Records, um, it began to track music sales because it created a database where we could log into and say, hey, here's how many copies of this album sold this week. And SoundScan was able to capture this information by literally sort of tying into the point of sales systems of the physical retail stores. So you literally can say, hey, there's you know, 7 million units of this particular album sold this week. Before that, these were faxes or phone calls or just handwritten lists where the billboard charts were based on what people wrote down. So if you bought somebody a washing machine or got them a, some, a whatever, they, they would fabricate stuff because then you'd be at the top of the charts. Now you couldn't do that anymore. And actually, if I remember correctly, it was 92, the industry got turned on its head. I think it was Garth Brooks because the first time SoundScan started, all of a sudden everyone was like, holy shit, holy cow, country music is selling really well. I believe Garth was, was number one on that particular week, which was a surprise. Anyway, the value of SoundScan to a publishing administrator is, for the first time, they at least had something they can use to audit. Oh my gosh, that album has at least sold you know, 1.3 million copies this week. We now know how many songs are on there. We know what the mechanical royalty rate is. We know how much we're supposed to get paid. We now will know if we're being underpaid. So at least they had some audit trail. It wasn't a perfect science because SoundScan did not capture every sale, but at least it provided a window in. We'll move along in time and up come downloads, or down come downloads, a new form of technology, new way for people to get music. And before I move into those, did all of that make sense? Okay. By the way, the compulsory license requires you to get paid on the 20th of the month for the sales that occurred, or rather for the reproductions of the previous month. Right. The other way to get a license, if it's not compulsory, is a direct license. I call you up, I say, hey, can I license the rights to your compositions? I'm going to make sound recordings, going to commercially distribute them. And then you can negotiate your own one-to-one -one terms. And these terms might be, I'm only going to pay you every 90 days, 45 days after the end of those 90 days, and I'm only going to pay you on what we've actually sold, not on what we manufactured. I'm only going to pay you 75% of the 9.1 cents. It's called a three-quarter rate. Right? And instead of paying you for every song on the album, I'm only going to pay you for 10 of the songs. Because what happens if you have 20 songs on an album? 20 songs on an album times the mechanical royalty rate at a full rate is a lot of money. And the labels had margins they had to work with. And so, geez, we've got to reduce that down. Let's do a three-quarter uh, 10x cap. 75% of the amount of money you're owed only on 10 songs. Three-quarter 10. So, all right. So then we get into this concept of digital. And what happens with digital is we have new ways to get music. And one of them is called a download. Well, the law didn't really deal with this. So they expanded the law to say that a download is a reproduction, a DPD, digital phonographic delivery, if I remember correctly. And a download from iTunes or Amazon MP3 or eMusic will generate the same mechanical royalty as it would on physical. Of course, this time it's a little easier because uh, the audit trails gets a little easier and you're not paying on promotional copies, right? It's just. It's unlimited inventory that replicates on demand only after it's bought, theoretically. And so when something is downloaded from iTunes in the United States, 9.1 cents today gets owed to the person that wrote the lyric and melody. Gets, you're supposed to be paid to the publishing administrator. That's sort of the chain, although sometimes that doesn't happen. But there's a, a court of, sort of a weird wrinkle to this, which I'll get into in a second. Then after downloads came streams. And streams are weird because they're sort of a download, but not. They, they stay there, then they go away. Or they'll stay there for 30 days, and if you haven't paid your subscription fee to Spotify, then they go away. 
Or if you don't have internet connection, they go away. Or they're tethered or untethered, or they're ads, all these different sort of permutations of the theme. Well, it was decided that that too is a reproduction. But in this case, this sort of reproduction, this use of the lyric and melody for a stream embodies more than just reproduction. It also embodies the right of public performance. So there's actually two sort of slices that are involved with a stream of a song. Public performance, reproduction. Now the royalty rate on that also had to be changed because the money wasn't the same on a download as it was on physical. And after fighting in Congress for a number of years, they came up with a mechanical royalty rate for a stream. These are the most complicated, convoluted formulas I have ever seen in my life. I still haven't been able to decipher them completely. There's multiple categories. And the way it works basically is 10.5% of the streaming service's gross revenue in a particular month is what's owed for the composition. All right, so if they made a million dollars, 10.5% of the million dollars. Now, that 10.5% of the million dollars, what's 10.5% of a million? 150? Geez, you guys are as bad at math as I am. Yeah, I know. Okay, 10 .5, that, of that 10.5%, some portion of it has to go for public performance, and some portion of it that's left over will go for mechanicals. Literally, it's being arbitrarily split. There's nothing in the copyright law that says how it's supposed to be split. It's just being split. So the performing rights organizations, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, they're getting a percentage of that. What's left over is supposed to be paid to the songwriter, publisher, publishing administrator. Uh, it is a much lower rate. These days, on an interactive stream, and I'll define that in a second, the mechanical royalty rate tends to be about 0 0.0008 per stream. Yeah, it's a little higher, a little lower, and it fluctuates month to month because the amount of money they make month to month varies, right? They have more subscribers, they have more advertising, they have less, they have more songs. Because what happens is, let's say that there's a million dollars left in the pot, and let's say there's only one million songs. Each song was streamed once, right? Each song would get a dollar. If there's two million songs, each song gets 50 cents. If there's three million songs, right? If there's a 40 million songs, as, it, as each, the number of streams of songs goes up, the amount that gets distributed per stream goes down. But that can be offset by how much money is in the pot. So it's, it's a moving target. And by the way, the stores each month have to run, I think, five or six different formulas. And one of them has subsection A and B, which they compare and then throw out the higher. And then the one that's left over compared against the other four. And then the one that's highest from those four is the rate that month. And you can view this stuff online. And they have to put them into categories of tethered, which means you can only listen to the song if you're connected to the internet. Untethered, which means it's on your phone or whatever, and you can stream it without net access, but if that net access expires after the end of the month and you haven't upped your fee, then it goes away. So that's untethered. And ad-supported versus subscription support. Just, and it's just so incredibly complicated. But that's the statutory rate. So for all of these, whether you like it or not, Someone can use your lyric and melody. So if there's a particular service you don't like, uh, you can't stop them from using your lyric and melody, provided they're following, bless you, the compulsory license. By the way, I used the term here, interactive. And it's really important to get this down. There are two types of streaming services. One is called interactive, one is called non-interactive. Pandora is the perfect example of non-interactive. Think of non-interactive like a radio station. You turn on the radio, it's AM, it's FM. Uh, you're listening to the song. You can't really control what happens next. You can call up the DJ and request something. Maybe you'll get it. Maybe you'll get a song like it. That's kind of like Pandora. So there's rules around that. It's called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and it lays out these rules for non-interactive DMCA, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, compliance, which means you can't listen to the same artist, I believe, more than twice in a half hour. You can't do more than five skips in like a half hour, you can't play the exact song that you've asked for when you asked for it. You can't go back, you can only go forward, you can't create play, you know, there's rules around it. Versus interactive, Spotify. Spotify is you're renting someone else's music collection, right, you're paying them money and they have access to their music collection, you can use it like it's yours. Start, stop, skip, playlist, go back, go forward, do whatever the heck you want. 
It's like your own music. So that's the difference between non-interactive and interactive. Non-interactive does not generate mechanical royalties. You only get paid for the right of public performance. Interactive, you get paid mechanical royalties. Public performance and the mechanical. That's just the way the law works here in the US. Make sense? We're boring you guys to tears. This stuff sometimes is like watching paint dry. Uh, but I, I swear to God, if you understand this stuff, if you get your head around it, you will understand how you're supposed to get paid, why you're not being paid, who's taking your money, and how they're making billions of dollars off of you without you even knowing it and not getting compensated. Yes? So the question is, non-interactive, is there public performance revenue for the artist? The answer is yes, and that has to do with the sound recording side, not for the composition side. So quickly to answer that question, in the United States, if, you're, if there is a sound recording uh, played on radio, so let me define that very quickly. Uh, Dolly Parton wrote a song called I Will Always Love You. It's about her ex-husband in the uh, 70s she was getting divorced to. It was not, because I just heard her, I saw her in an interview, I swear to God, I just saw her in an interview saying that. It was about Porter Wagner. Because they were accused I just watched it on this like, okay. Dude, I have to change my whole story now. As I was saying, Dolly Parton, Dolly Parton wrote a song about Porter Wagner <laughs> called I Will Always Love You. Perhaps you've heard of Porter. And um, many years later, uh, Kevin Costner did a great movie called The Bodyguard, which uh, Whitney Houston uh, sang a version of the song that was recorded by Sony Records distributed by Sony that Dolly had written. Right, so in that you have the two copyrights. The sound recording is owned by Sony Records and the lyric and melody, the composition is controlled by Dolly Parton, just to, to define the, uh, the two different parts of it. And what we're discussing is AM FM radio when they play that sound recording of Whitney Houston singing I Will Always Love You, which I will sing before this ends. <laughs> Hell no. Uh, the record label Sony does not get paid by the radio station for the broadcast, for them playing that sound recording. Most other parts of the world, Sony Records would get paid. But here in the United States, they don't do that. Uh, up comes digital, things like Pandora. Uh, physical sales were declining. The labels lobbied, Congress negotiated, and got a law passed that said if there is a digital transmission that is non-interactive, like Pandora, that they do get paid for that, even though they're not getting paid for AM and FM radio. And there was an organization created called Sound Exchange uh, under sanction of the government where any digital transmission of a sound recording, there is a rate that has to be paid. It gets paid to Sound Exchange, which any of you can become a member of for free. And then Sound Exchange will pay out money for the public performance of the sound recording. Whereas ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC are paying out the money for the public performance of the composition. Okay. So, moving back to this, Here are some, here's one of the fun nuances of mechanical royalties in the United States. I'm going to stick with the U.S. only. You've got a digital download store. I've put iTunes and Amazon MP3 up there. It gets, a song gets purchased. When the song gets purchased, 9.1 cents, if it's under five minutes, is owed to the publishing administrator. There is something in the law that allows what's called a pass-through. And what that means is iTunes and Amazon don't have to pay the 9.1 cents. The burden to pay that money is on the record label or the distributor. Right? So it's not on them, it's on the label and the distributor. And the label and the distributor are supposed to pay you the mechanical royalties that you are owed for each download, for each reproduction. That's the way it works. Um, if it's under the compulsory, that's how. If it's under direct license, uh, you can do different terms. You can also pre-buy mechanical downloads. You literally can go to a website. I think it's, uh, what's Harry Fox's website? Song, song File? Yeah. You can go to a website and you can say, hey, I want to pre-purchase 100 downloads. And you'll get charged 9.1 cents per download plus a little commission that they make on that. And then you can download that song a uh, uh, 100 times. By the way, if you do it on your own website and you allow it to be downloaded from your own website, that's a reproduction, even if you're giving it away for free. And that's why people pre-buy this stuff. So that's the way that's supposed to work. Where it gets more interesting is here. 
This is on streams. Streams have a different rate, which we've discussed. They have the rate of public performance in there, where a download does not. And notice there's no pass-through. The label in the distributor over here, what this means is on the 20th of the month, Spotify, Rhapsody, Beats, Deezer, Symphy, Microsoft, uh, go through the list. They're required to pay you directly on the 20th of the month for the previous month's streams. This applies to everybody, publishing administrators, publishers, songwriters, you are supposed to get paid. And by the way, you're also supposed to get a notice of intent from them prior to the sound recording that embodies your lyric and melody going live in their service. If you do not get that notice of intent, they are infringing on your copyright. It's copyright infringement. Uh, if you are not getting your payment and they've got the, the license, now they've breached the compulsory license. I mean, th these are the rules. Hell, you get to use it, we don't get to say no. The least you could do is freaking pay us when you're supposed to. So that's the way that's supposed to work. And by the way, of the 10.5%, it's split up very, very loosely. About six, six and a half percent goes for public performance, and the balance, the four, four, uh, three and a half, four percent, goes for mechanicals. What's kind of weird about that, very quickly, by the way, think about this. I have a dollar in my hand. I'm going to pay you 60 cents of the dollar, and I'm going to give her the other 40 cents directly. She then is going to take 20% of the 60 cents because that's her fee, uh, her administrative fee as a performing rights organization, and then is going to pay you the balance of the money maybe six months later after deducting her 20%. I just want to point out I'm a big supporter of performing rights organizations. It seems very strange to me in this particular example, if you are a self-published songwriter, why you would want a third party intercepting a piece of your money before kicking it back to you six months later. Now, if you're a songwriter that's in a publishing administration deal, okay, there's a value there because what the performing rights organization will do will take the 60 cents and split it. And they'll pay half of it to the publishing administrator, which in this case, let's make it, I don't know, big publishing company, and the other 30 cents will be paid directly to you as the songwriter. So there's a value proposition that way, but if you're not in a publishing administration deal, if you control your own rights, you've just created an intermediary that's taking a percentage of your money, adding latency to getting paid, makes it hard to audit, and on top of that, taking somewhere between 18 to 20 percent of it before paying you six months later. It makes no sense because I'm already paying you directly. They can't even negotiate a rate because the government has set it, so there's no value in that. Just something to think about. Did that make sense? Okay. So anyway, that's the way that works. So I'm just curious, how many actual songwriters are in this room? You've actually written a song. Are you getting paid mechanical royalties if you're not in a publishing deal, meaning you control everything yourself on the 20th of the month from every single digital service in the United States that streams? That's the, that's the problem. That's what gets me so angry because these companies are using your music to make a lot of money. They have to do one of these two things. They either have to send you a notice of intent and make the payment and follow the rules or direct license from you and make the payment and follow the rules or you don't get to use someone else's property to make money and become worth $3 billion like Spotify or do an IPO like Pandora, which is a different ball of wax, I understand, or sell Xboxes or Xbox subscriptions. You do realize that Microsoft is using your music to sell Xboxes and Xbox subscriptions. Right? Are you getting paid by them on the 20th of the month? Because they're, they're publicly traded, their stock's going up. They're worth how many hundreds of billions of dollars? So why is all this happening? So, well, the music industry, let's face it, if you're an artist or a label, and if you're talentless, you have no talent in music like myself, you like to you know, get near the people that do to get the bleed off. Uh, it's sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I mean, it really is. And if you're a publisher or a publishing administrator, it's about licensing. You want Spielberg to use your song in his movie. Uh, you want someone to record your song. You want Taylor Swift to do a cover. That's what we do. We make culture. We make art, um, which is incredibly valuable to society. We don't make smartphones. We don't build computers. We don't make operating systems. It's not what we do. We make art, and we license it. 
then we go out and gig and all that other fun stuff. On the flip side, and I'm not knocking them because they do innovation as well. Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Spotify, Rhapsody, AT&T, these are technology companies, right? They don't write Hotel California and record it any more than you make a smartphone. So what we have here are two different cultures that don't even speak the same, same language. And that creates a lot of problems. One of them has to do, too, with a non-alignment of interests. In the old days, um, when there was a five-inch circular piece of plastic with pre-recorded music on it on the shelf of Tower Records, and somebody would go to buy it, Tower Records would make money off of the sale of that CD. So would, would, so would the distributor of that CD, so would the record label, and theoretically, so would the artist. Everybody wanted the music to sell. That's how they all made money. That was the economic food chain. And the publisher wanted it as well because then there were more being reproduced and they got paid off of those sales. We wanted it to sell. You really think Spotify cares if they're making money off the music? Daniel Eck, the founder and CEO of Spotify, which by the way helped to build the original Napster, just FYI. You know, in all his interviews, says his focus isn't on generating revenue, it's on market share. Pandora loses money every single month, had an IPO where the people that invested in that company made billions. They lost money on music and still made billions. Did you get paid off of uh, Pandora's IPO? Yeah. Did you know Pandora is trying to drive down how much money they pay you through legislation in Congress? Did you know that they're attempting to buy an AM FM station in North Dakota in order to find a loophole in copyright law to drive down what they have to pay you? You think they care? You are a means to an end to make money, but the interests are now not aligned. Apple, fantastic company, most valuable company on the planet, made $18 billion in three months in net gross profit. That was just their earnings statement that came out. Hardware, software, iPhones, iPads, tablets, computers, Apple TV, these are great products, I love them, I use them all. They don't make, the making money off of the music was a happy mistake. They make their money off of the sale of these things. If they lost money, Amazon, lost leader, Lady Gaga, 99 cents for the new album. Why? Because they'll make money in other ways. It's a loss leader for market share, for IPOs, for hardware, for software. So you have this non-alignment of interest now where music is being used to make money in different ways than beyond the use of the music. Right? Tower Records needed to sell the damn CD. They don't. They give it away. So you've got that problem. The next problem that you've got is dealing with the music industry is complicated. In their defense, and it, it, very much in their defense, we made it hard. We didn't have our act together. Let's go to the song Daft Punk, they do Get Lucky. You guys know that song, Get Lucky? Tell me who the songwriters are on it. Where is there a simple, easy place to go to find out who the songwriters are on that? And I know you can go to ASCAP or BMI and poke in there and some of the performing rights organizations. Is that information up to date? Okay, maybe we'll know the songwriters. Who are the publishing administrators on that? Maybe you owned a slice of the copyright and sold it to you. Does that get updated? Where does it get updated? Where is there to go to look this stuff up? It's hard. We didn't create an easy way to do it. It's kind of the way the industry grew up. You've got these two disparate sections. You've got sound recordings over here, and you've got publishing over here. We have like two completely separate pieces of information, and nobody keeps track of anything. Okay, granted, it's hard. But that's not an excuse. If you want to use someone else's property to make money, and it's hard to figure out who that person is, don't use the property or take some of your $3 billion and go figure it the hell out. Right? It's not that difficult of a problem to overcome if you want to. So what happened is the technology companies didn't have an easy solution, so they kind of punted it, and the problem persisted and got worse to the point where no streaming service, with one exception, no streaming, interactive streaming service in the United States built any infrastructure. They built nothing. Nothing to pay songwriters and publishers and publishing administrators the royalties. Nothing has been built. Which means that at the end of the month, pick your, pick your flavor here, from Spotify to Rhapsody to Beats to RDO to Microsoft to anything you want. At the end of the month, 
they have what's called a usage log. The usage log is a list of every sound recording that exists in that digital music service. And right now, in Spotify, there's a little over 30 million, I think. And next month, by the way, it'll be 30 million 150,000. And the following month, it'll be 30 million 200,000. You know, it grows every month. They hand that usage log to you. Now, this poor person's job here in, in the front row is to figure out what each one of those sound recordings is a sound recording of. What is this a sound recording of? So, you record a song called Butterfly, and you put it up into Spotify through CD Baby, TuneCore, InGroove, The Orchard, IOTA, you know, pick your flavor, and it goes into Spotify. What is it a sound recording of? Is it your new version of Butterfly? Is it the Jason Mraz version? Is it the Mariah Carey version? Is it the Crazy Town version? Is it Hans's version in Dusseldorf, Germany? Is it, you know, Ichi, whatever his name is in Japan's version? Whose version of Butterfly is this? And how do you figure that out? Right? You gotta figure it out. And how are you gonna do that? You can't listen to 30 million sound recordings. Now the way it should work, theoretically, is because we're dealing with technology, you have a database, and information goes into it, and the database should be able to figure this out. But here's the problem. Hey, we're a technology company, music industry. We, we've got funded by venture capital out of Menlo Park. Uh, you know, it's so-and-so and so-and-so. -so. Like technology, this is disruptive. In a media sector, big opportunity. So we have this culture of Silicon Valley in us. Could you please have your in-house engineers that write machine language code up in XML2 metadata feeds, the relational data necessary to relate a sound recording to a composition, put that into an FTP authenticated drop, or we'll put it into our cloud-based non-relational big data database and apply our business logic and pay at the end of the month. What? Right? It's like me saying, hey, could you go please write the, um, the, the chord of chords for this particular song and put it in a particular arrangement and get that back to me. We don't know what the heck they're saying. That's not what we do, but that's what they said to the music industry. So data gets poured into their database and doesn't get checked, and bad things begin to happen, like Butterfly goes into the database, and we don't know whose version of Butterfly it is. So what happens at the end of each month, for the last 10 plus years, 15 to 30% of those sound recordings do not get mapped back to any composition. The money they've generated does not get paid out. It is sitting in their bank account. It's probably on their profit and loss statement as a liability, at least I hope it is. Maybe after five years, they book it as retained income. Maybe they're supposed to give it to the state of Delaware where they're incorporated under something called achievement issues because there are somebody else's royalties they can't figure out who it is. You don't get to just keep people's money like that. I don't know what happens to it. There's no clarity on this. But I know it doesn't get paid out. By the way, 100 million plus not paid out. Yeah, we got 10 years of this stuff that's been lined up there. Of the other 70 to 75% that does get paid out, all right, you've got about 9% of that money is being paid either to the wrong entity or has the wrong what they call songwriter splits. You and you write a song, you control 30%, she controls 70%. The, I get this information, I pay it 50-50. Right? So about 9% of the money that's being paid out is being paid erroneously, wrong songwriter splits, wrong entities, wrong companies. You in this room that are publishing administrators, you know this. You've gotten these statements in. You see, why am I getting this money? This isn't my stuff. Now what am I supposed to do with it? Right? What are you supposed to do with it? And you know, if you go and you find the person you're supposed to give it to, now you're doing their freaking job and they're not paying you to do it. Why should you do their job? Yes, sir. So the question is, how do ISRCs play into all this? I'm about to roll into it. It's a great question. So what we have here is a problem that hasn't been fixed yet. And it's global, by the way. This isn't just the United States. This is endemic globally. Uh, the same issue exists in every other country with the performing rights and collection agencies having to try to filter through. The difference between the United States and the rest of the world in regards to this is in the rest of the world, they have these third-party collection agencies. Right? So they can take those usage logs and they can hand them to these collection agencies abroad who are supposed to do that work for them. That's what they historically have done. Whether or not they're able to do the job is a different topic, but at least there's something there. In the United States, we don't have a mechanical royalty collection uh, agency. There's the Harry Fox agency, but it's not like it is in the rest of the world. So it creates some problems. Why do these problems exist? 
Well, it goes back to technology in the database. Right? They are just big databases that have information in them that have business logic applied to them that are supposed to pay out royalties based on formulas. So when we deliver information, the question that was just asked is, well, how does an ISRC play into this? When we deliver information into the database, theoretically what should happen is, hi, I'm a song called Butterfly. The recording of the song has a unique identifier to it that no other recording in the world has. My identifier was like a thumbprint. No one else has it. My identifier is US A249736, whatever. But that's only the unique identifier for the sound recording, not for the composition. Now, if you are a songwriter, publisher, publishing administrator, and you've become a member of a performing rights organization, like BMI, ASCAP, or CSAC, and you give them a song, they will assign that song something called an I. SWC. That is different than an ISRC. It is unattached to an ISRC. The two don't even talk to each other. They live in different neighbor they live in different planets. There's no way they, they relate. So you've got a unique identifier theoretically for the lyric and melody. I'm one, two, three, four, five. You've got a unique identifier for the sound recording. I'm four, five, six, seven, eight. But how do the two relate to each other? When you input into that database, I'm a sound recording of Butterfly, this is who performed me, this is the name of my album, this is my street date, this is how long I run, this is my ISRC, it does not answer the question of whose lyric and melody is it. What should happen in the best case ideal world is it goes in with something called metadata, words to describe music, how long it is, who wrote it, etc. Hi, I'm Butterfly, I'm a sound recording of one, two, three, four, five. And in that database should be something that says, I am one, two, three, four, five. And with that, the two should then link together because now they're friends, they're soulmates. And every time this sound recording now gets streamed, the soulmate also gets paid. That's how it should work, but it doesn't. Because in their defense, again, there was nowhere for them to go to find out this information, but not in their defense, then you don't use someone else's property if you can't figure it out. Or you go solve the freaking problem. Be quiet. I thought I'd turn this thing off. The hazards of digital. Right? So when you speak to the digital services, they will tell you this is a problem that we can't solve. It's stifling innovation without the compulsory license. You know, and they just whine and they moan. I mean, I have been on the phone with the lawyers for these major services who have told me that they refuse to invest in the infrastructure. They will not direct license. And I swear to God, three times I heard, and what's the big deal? It's not a lot of money anyway. Okay, this is three of the major players. I'm so tempted to just tell you who it is. Anyway, <laughs> and who the lawyer was. God, that made me angry. I'm like, so your pitch to music publishers is, we don't have the ability to pay you. We refuse to put that ability together. We won't license from you properly, and there's no money in it for you. Well, gee, there's a great sale. Yeah, well, let's, please use my stuff so you can sell your Xboxes or whatever. So um, yeah, that, this is the part that really gets, gets, me, uh, gets me going. So how did all of this happen? Like, how do we get to this point? Well, part of the problem is that compulsory license I talked about, right? Spotify, et cetera, have to send you a notice of intent under the compulsory license. If they do that, they now have a license to it. There is no audit clause in the compulsory license. So the United States government, when it passed this law, did not give you the right of owning a piece of intellectual property to assure you're being paid accurately. It doesn't exist. So how do you know what you're not getting? How are you supposed to figure this out? Right? There's no audit clause. Another reason why, um, no infrastructure was built. It just doesn't exist. It doesn't matter, nobody knows this because we have no audit clause. We can't see in there. And by the way, this stuff is confusing as hell. This is unbelievably confusing, and I'm going to get to another layer of confusion in a second. And then, oh, there's not a lot of money. Well, let's think about that. If any of you have been paid for a stream from Rhapsody, Spotify, Beats, etc., you probably, I'm going to guess, get very confusing, convoluted statements that you can't make heads or tails out of, and like a check for 50 bucks. And you've got a 60-page statement, which is at a seven-point font if you get it in paper, or you have to download it online from a website that looks like it was built in 1984, when Windows first came out, and it's just like, really? I only have so much time in the day. 
I'll make more in one gig than I will off of, you know, three years of this. Screw it, I'll just, you know, I'm happy to get the check and I move on in life, right? Because this stuff is confusing. So, actually, I want to show you something over here. I'm popping around, let's see if I can find what I did with this. Where are you? Ah, okay. So here's an example. Yeah. By the way, um, if you go in and you clean up these databases, if you do their job for them, guess what happens? All the stuff about, oh, we've been paying you accurately flies out the window. Because here I am, you know, we got this money in. Granted, it's only 0 .00234, and it's only from Slacker, and it's only from December of 2007. Uh, but we got that in 90 days ago by cleaning up their data. Right, I can go through here. Here's another fun one. Those of you who are publishing uh, administrators, you probably recognize this, this user interface. Look at the years. 2011, I got that in 60 days ago. 2012, I got that in 60 days ago. I mean, yeah. You know how I got it? I went in for my clients and I cleaned up the, the data. I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit. But I want you to see that this is tangible. I'm not just blowing smoke. You are not getting paid. And they are using your music. And we don't understand this. And nobody's doing anything about it. And I feel like they're getting away with something. And more importantly, I feel your music has value. And if somebody wants to use it, you should be paid. And you have to build the infrastructure. And I'm sorry if it's hard. Why don't you go try being a band for a year? Why don't you go write a freaking song of your own? And if you're not going to do that in your technology company, stop whining, create the infrastructure, and pay these people. And if you're not going to, then don't use the music. It's not that hard to want to be paid accurately and on time. Is that really asking too much? Microsoft, Apple, would you be happy if the credit card company only paid you 80% of your money each month because they say they can't figure out where the 20% is supposed to go? That's what's happening here. This is real. This is one page. I've gotten over $206,000 in in the past 90 days for my clients. Right? Of that $206,000 for just 28 of them, just 28 of them, 65% of that money comes from before 2014. I just got paid Zoom money. You know, and, and so anyway, it just, this just infuriates me. And this is just a couple of the interfaces. Now, I'm going to, going to divert for a second and explain to you. Uh, here, let's, let's, what the heck, let's go to a different year. Just for, let's go to 2012 and see if we've got anything in there. Oh, look at that. 2012. Okay. So, let me go back on my, get off my little soapbox a little bit. Um, how does this then work if they built no infrastructure? Okay, the first thing you, all of you need to know is you are in a deal with the digital music service. You are not in a deal with anybody else. Somebody calls you up. Anyone here of Music Reports? Okay, you're not in a deal with Music Reports. It doesn't matter what they say to you. It doesn't matter how they tell you how you're supposed to send them information. Oh, we need you to fill out this uh, Excel spreadsheet and if you could please put the permutation. You know. No, you know what? I don't have to do anything. I'm not in a deal with you, and it's your boss using the music. There is nothing that says I have to jump through 16 hoops in order to get paid. You want to use my music, you need to pay me. You don't want to pay me, you're infringing on my copyright. I'm going to notify you. If you don't cure the breach, you're in willful infringement, and I can sue you. I don't have to do any of this crap. This is what you're paid for, uh, third-party company. So remember, you're not in a deal with these third-party companies. But let me quickly get into the third-party companies. So if they built no infrastructure to pay these mechanical royalties, how then do they get paid at all? Because they are paying money. I don't want to suggest nothing's being paid out. Things are being paid out. It's just not all of it, and it's not accurate. So they hire third-party companies to do it for them. There are four of them in the United States that get hired. One is called Music Reports. All right, so I showed you very quickly Music Reports, some of their clients. That's who they're hired by, as an example. Another one is the Harry Fox Agency. All right, these are some of their clients. So there's two of them. A third one is called MediaNet. MediaNet has been paying out the royalties for Beats. Uh, that's now been acquired by Apple, and we'll see what happens with that, amongst others. So there's sort of a, a smaller one. And the fourth one is called Rights Flow. And RightsFlow uh, pays out Google Play mechanical royalties, and RightsFlow was acquired 
by Google, YouTube. Right? So it's, it's now Google actually has its own in-house solution for paying mechanical royalties and did some things that some of the others aren't doing. But those are the four. Music Reports Incorporated, the Harry Fox Agency, MediaNet, and Google Rightsflow. Those are the, the four entities, and we're going to pull Rightsflow out because they just basically do Google Play. So those are the people that get the usage logs at the end of the month and then are tasked with this service. And as you can see, uh, they can't do the job. I'm not knocking them. It's just they don't have the ability to do it. Yes? So the question is, what about SongSpace, which is a destination website where someone can go and do a search and see who all the songwriters are that are involved in the writing of a particular song? Did I paraphrase that correctly? Uh, my answer is, I don't know SongSpace. It sounds like a great start. I don't know if it also lists the publishers or publishing administrators, which is another very important part of it. It does. Great. So we have the beginnings of what it sounds like of a database that provides information. I've never heard of it. I'm going to go check it out after we're done with this today. Good to know about. Yes? Yeah, I was going to say, I think that that would be a good place to put the data that you have for the discounter. So the, 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 the statement is that it's, a newer, it's a newer company. It's just gone online. They're just beginning to get information in. It's possibly a solution. They're beginning to talk to the major publishers to get their information in as well. Uh, part of the other problem that exists is many of the music publishing entities do not want to give out their information. It's proprietary, it's confidential. Uh, for whatever reason, they don't really want to willingly give it out. So there's a lot of confidentiality around it. If I remember correctly, Universal Music Publishing is talking about making all this information open for the first time in regards to their uh, publishing administration and, and copyrights they control. It'll be interesting to see how that fans out. There was something called the GRD, the Global Repertory Database. The concept behind it was to create this massive database which would have all this information in it between sound recordings and compositions and ways to match it and map it all together. And it, it fell apart, uh, which I, uh, sadly, which I kind of understandably uh, understand why. The other problem is you're a kid, you here, live here in Nashville or a young adult, whatever, and you write a song, Comfy Chair, and uh, you know, how do you know what you're supposed to do? You record it, you distribute it into Spotify. The name of that new organization you just said, what's it called again? Songspace. Songspace. You know, the kids never heard of Songspace, isn't affiliated with ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, nevertheless controls those six copyrights, is supposed to get a notice of intent, and is supposed to get paid. Yeah, it's hard, right? You got to figure that out. Each time somebody's born and becomes a musician, creates, writes something, you know, there's a new piece of copyright that's been created. How do you educate the, the, the masses on the planet? of, hey, this is what you have to do. Heck, we have sound exchange. Most people don't even know what that is. They distributed over, or collected over $750 million last year uh, from, on the sound recording side, and they're like sitting on piles of money. All people have to do is go register. We can't even get that at 100%. So this is part of the challenge. Uh, I think part of the solution, by the way, might be to require the entity that's doing the distribution of the sound recording to include that information. Anyway. So you've got these third parties, MRI, MediaNet, HFA, Rightsflow, and you can see the user interfaces that they have. And I'm sorry, I, the, the user interfaces are, should be better, in my opinion. Um, you get calls from these companies, as many of you are aware. I want to remind you of this. They don't work, you don't work for them, they don't work for you. You don't have to do anything with them. Uh, you know, the default that is happening with music reports they pay 45 days after the end of a quarter. You can't do that. That's not what, the, you know, well, you can do that. Then your boss is infringing on copyright. You're supposed to pay on the 20th of the month. That's the way it works. Well, you know, go speak to MRI. No, I'm going to talk to you. You're talking to me? I'm going to talk to you because you're the entity using my music. They're not using my music. Well, go talk to them anyway. No. You know, and that, these are sort of the, the machinations I've gone through. Um, I finally got sick of it. So I'm going to tell you something about the compulsory license. And this is one of the things, collectively, we can do to fix this problem. The compulsory license allows you to send a legal letter to the digital streaming services, or anyone that's infringing uh, under the compulsory, and gives them 30 days to cure the breach. Okay, that's the law. 
well, this is going to be a tough one. How do I know I'm not being paid accurately? I don't have access to audit. You're not being paid accurately. Okay, you're just not. Send the letter. Give them 30 days. After the end of those 30 days, if they haven't cured the breach, and they're not able to, by default, they've just lost the rights to the compositions. Okay, so I work for, represent and work for the Red Hot Chili Peppers in North America, their catalog, Metallica, uh, Jason Mraz, um, James Taylor, Jackson Brown, a whole bunch of compositions. Uh, Epitaph Records Music Publishing, uh, Victory Records Music Publishing, uh, a number of publishers here in Nashville. On their behalf, I sent this letter. And guess what? They wouldn't talk to me. I wouldn't, couldn't get them on the phone. Sent the letter, 30 days went by, hired a great litigation firm the RAAA uses, um, Jenner. 30 days have expired. You've now lost the compulsory license. You have to take down all the sound recordings. Guess who called me? Finally, I got them on the phone. And they went, they went ballistic on me. You, you know, you're a, you're a disruptor. That's not, you're a bad actor in the space. This is impossible. I mean, they were, it's, this is when I got the, we're not going to do it. We, it. This is impossible. And what's the big deal? It's not a lot of money anyway. Yeah, we're paying accurately. You don't know. I'm like, really? Well, if you, know, if you won't work with me on this, fine. I will make an example out of one of you, and I'll figure it out. And what will happen is when we get to discovery and I get your usage logs, you better hope to God that there is not one sound recording in there that you're not paying out on. And by the way, I'm sitting here looking at master sound recording statements and comparing them against the publishing statements. And guess what? You're underreporting by 25%. You're not doing your job. I'm not trying to put you out of business. I just want you to pay accurately. Let me help you. Send me the usage log. I'll do the mapping and matching. Oh, we can't do that. I don't need to know what people are making. I'll just map them together. We'll go talk to these third parties. The third parties went nuts. Well, one of them did. It, you know, they hired a litigator, threatened to sue me. I'm like, I don't, I'm not in a deal with you. I don't care. And ultimately what happened is, finally, after going through this arm wrestling match, made some progress and was able to dig out a couple hundred grand on behalf of some of our clients and are working through a process now where I get to do their jobs for them. Right? I'm literally doing their jobs for them. They're not paying me okay, I'll help fix the problem and I'll get you guys paid, but my gosh, it's been difficult. But I'll tell you, if a number of publishers of any note or significance, publishing administrators, did this simultaneously, believe me, things would change very quickly, particularly on the tail end of Taylor Swift, right? So um, yeah, do it before the IPO, not after, by the way. So uh, yeah, it's, it's confusing as hell and there's not a lot of money. What do I got next year? Okay, so what is Audium? Oh yeah, I reminded myself I'm supposed to go to something else. But before I do that, uh, I wanted to make sure all of that made sense. Mechanical royalties and downloads versus streams, why you're not getting paid, the data problems, how they're being just overlooked, the compulsory license with no audit clause, the confusion around all of this. Are there any questions on any of this? So the question is, what method did Taylor Swift use to get her things pulled out of Spotify? No, Taylor Swift did not use a breach of the compulsory license. She just has control through her label, Big Machine, over her sound recordings and made the decision to remove them. Oh, come on, I'm not that good. <laughs> okay, yes. How am I covering the cost of business on my end to do their jobs for them? Well, the upside of all of this is we're dealing with technology. These are machines. Machines can do lots of things in huge volume all at once. Trillions of transactions occur financially and so forth. And the answer is that the answers and the solutions to this problem all exist today. They're just out there in these different databases and machines. So if you can create the right technology and you know what you're looking for and how to find it, you can then automate the solution. So for example, uh, and this turns into, so what is Audium? I'll pull up a slide in a minute. Um, Leonard Cohen wrote a brilliant song called Hallelujah. A brilliant song. Buckley did an incredible cover of it as well. I can log into my system and I can pull up for you every sound, commercially released sound recording that exists of that composition in the digital music services. And I can provide back to you not only the name of the song. I can tell you who performed it, its release date. I can provide you a link to its preview clip, to its buy clip. I can tell you the unique identifier each service gives it. I can tell you the ISRC. I can tell you the runtime. I can pull all that out. 
and then I can map, take that information, map it back to your information. So if you're a publisher, publishing administrator out here, this is part of what I do, what we get hired to do. I will create for you metadata that goes out 50 spaces to the right. You'll have the name of your song. You'll have what percentage you control. You'll have the name of the songwriter. You'll have the name of the publisher. You'll have the name of the publishing administrator. You'll have your ISWC if you provided that or if you go dig it out. You'll have a list of ISRCs of your sound recordings. For Red Hot Chili Peppers, we found over 22,000 sound recordings. Okay, for Hallelujah, I found 4,632 sound recordings. For White Christmas, I found 12,848 sound recordings. Right? So I create an automated process. I know what I'm looking for, I know how to look for it. And I created a, not me, but the team created a database where we can pull that information in and ingest it, update, and then re-deliver it out. Now part of the problem that exists is there's only one place where I can throw the baseball where they can catch it. And that's YouTube and uh, Google Play. They created this infrastructure where I can do these automated feeds in the way I've just described. Oh, sound recordings, let's enhance the metadata. Let's put it in, let's re-deliver it in. I can do that via machine with YouTube and Google Play. I can't do that with anybody else. Right. If I find these 14, oh, sorry, 12,000 sound recordings or whatever it might be, and I've turned to the digital services and I said, how do I deliver this to you? I don't know, go speak to my third party. I speak to the third party, they're like, oh, you can email it to us. It, that doesn't work. Yeah, I can't just start emailing you. I mean, I have a process where every hour it doesn't update, it doesn't update, it doesn't update. You want, I mean, this doesn't work, but they built no interface. That's part of the problem. But yeah, it has to scale, it has to be automated, but the good news is this is what machines and databases do. This is what big data is. It's just transactional volume. I'm the most boring person in the music business. I am, I just do like cleanup of metadata. But this is where the money is. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, how do we, I'm going to paraphrase you, and if I've done it wrong, please correct me. How can we create a way for the distributors who are sending the sound recordings and the digital music services that are using them, how can we create a way for them to work together to help solve this problem? Because it's basically kind of where the problem's originating, right? Okay. So, you know, look, hand up in the air. I'm part of the reason this mess exists, right? I created TuneCore, a way for anyone to come and distribute sound recordings and and I had to come up with a way to deal with the licensing of the composition. I was thrown out of my company uh, two and a half years ago by an institutional venture capital organization called Opus. If you look at the board of directors, it now has a guy named Art Shaw who runs an auto repair company. It has a guy that used to be an attorney at Cravath, a law firm that deals with litigation, I think with commercial securities, and a guy named Gil Kogan who is an institutional venture capital guy who's very good at what he does. The company is being run by a C, my former COO that I hired and recruited in, who was the head of customer care at eHarmony. Okay. This is who is running a music company. And yeah, and this scares the heck out of me. So the answer to your question is I, I created a, a publishing administration infrastructure for TuneCore and most likely would have come up with a solution to a problem that I was working on. But I'm gone, Peter's gone, Gary's gone, John's gone, Tom's gone. They threw us all out. So, um, so culpamia, but at the same time, I didn't get to fix the phone. It's not just me, no. Well, so to, to pick up on this, so the problem is this. Uh, first of all, in the streaming services, the onus and burden is on the streaming service to get those licenses. Okay, that's the way, if we go back a couple slides, that's the way it works because there is no pass-through. They have the burden of figuring out, they have the burden of doing the payment. In this particular scenario, it's different. Okay, the burden in this scenario, uh, when you deal between distribution to a digital download store, what usually happens is this, the entity that is putting the sound recording into that store has to warrant and represent to that store that it has secured the license to the composition before they distribute it. Right? They say, yeah, I got it. Now what, tr what happens in many of these stores, uh, or CD Babies, TuneCores, et cetera, they don't do that. 
Instead, what they do is they, through their terms and conditions, put the burden and onus on their customer. And their customer is warranting and representing to them that, yes, I went and got the license. Now, the problem is you cover Hotel California, and you have, I mean, you think most, pe most people don't know this stuff. Heck, you're here, and I bet there's some new things you've learned, right? So nobody quite understands how to do this. It's not common knowledge. And so if some kid innocently, a uh, woman or man, recovers a song, thinks it's great, distributes it out, has no idea that they've just infringed on copyright and warranted and represented to somebody else that they've got a license they don't have with an indemnification clause that says in the event this company gets sued, that company can come back and sue them. Those sound recordings then get distributed to the digital music services, by the way. And so what happens is I'll go back to those Leonard Cohen, Hallelujah sound recordings of which there's over 4,000. I will put hard money on the table, I'm serious, and I know this, that over, of the 4,000, I will bet any, anything that over 2,500 of them are unlicensed on the composition side, and no mechanical royalties have ever been paid for a download in the United States on them. Okay? So ultimately, where's the burden on this? The burden would be if you were a publisher, publishing administrator, you figured this out because I got you the data or you hire me to do it for you. You then pick up the phone and you call the distributor and say, I've got empirical proof here. You've distributed these sound recordings. I've got access to some sales information. You know, these sound recordings, let's go to the Beatles catalog. How many covers do you think there are of Beatles songs? All right, I'm gonna guess in, uh, I'm just gonna guess on the download stores, there's gotta be at least a couple million. It's gotta be, let's put it at a million. And how many, ver how many copies of those have sold. And remember, the Beatles weren't up in the download stores until recently, so we had, what, seven years of Beatles covers up there? So let's put the, uh, the sound recording sales at 10 million, sake of conversation. 10 million times 9.1 cents. Nine, $910,000, almost a million bucks. Right? You can pick up the phone, you can call somebody. Where's my million dollars? That's gonna start happening. Uh, so part of, I think part of the solution, though, is that the onus should be put on the entity distributing the sound recording to include that information. It just has to, you know? And if they don't want to include it, then it doesn't go in. And yeah, it's a pain in the butt, but you know, this is the space that we're in, it's the way it works. Sorry, question, yes sir. Correct, non-interactive does not pay mechanicals, they only pay public performance. By the way, uh, in these remaining sort of five-ish minutes, I wonder where the food is. Um, and the remaining five-ish minutes, if you really want to sort of a mind blow, in the United States, if we go back to this on a download, all that's owed is uh, mechanical royalties and the right of reproduction. If there's a download in the, in the UK or anywhere in Europe, it's different. They actually need the right of communication and the right of reproduction. The right of communication is part of the right of public performance. So the way the law works in the EU in the UK is on a download, okay, there's money owed for the right of public performance and there's money owed for the right of reproduction. Just the way the law went down. Now think about this. If you are a self-published songwriter, meaning you've written a song, you own the copyright and you haven't signed the rights away to anybody else for signing power, and you that song gets recorded and gets downloaded in the United Kingdom, you are not being paid your mechanical royalties because it doesn't work like that in the United Kingdom. The only money that comes back from the United Kingdom is the money for the recording. No money for the lyric and melody comes back. So the question is, how did that digital music service get a license to your composition to allow that download to happen? All right, they'll say, we did a deal with a local, local collection agency and performing rights organization in the United Kingdom called PRS, and another one called MCPS, it's good alphabet soup. And we, you know, we got a license from them. And your response is, well, I've never become a member of ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC, or anybody. How could you get my rights from them? I, I control my rights. Or your answer could be, I did do a deal with ASCAP, uh, BMI, or CSAC. And through that deal, they passed my rights over to PRS in England. And I'm, okay, but, by the way, digital music service, that's only for the right of public performance. ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC do not represent the right of reproduction. So where exactly did you get that other right from? Well, right, so you're basically there is global infringement happening. And what happens is overseas, is, hey, did the food show up? Awesome.
Okay, so what happens is the digital music service doesn't want to deal with this problem ab abroad either. They take all the money that's been generated, they hand it over to the collection agency in that country that had no right to collect your money, by the way. That entity knows they're getting money for copyrights they don't represent. They take an administrative fee anyway, put it in their pocket. They split the money between the right of public performance and reproduction arbitrarily based on their board of directors. And then they take your money and they put it in something called a black box, which they then will give to Warner Music, BMI, uh, BMG, et cetera, based on their market share in that country. So congratulations, you're subsidizing the traditional music industry. And they know they're doing this to you. Oh, it drives, that's a whole nother. Uh, so yeah, there's layers and layers of this stuff. Um, yes, sir. So the question is, the importance of ISRCs is getting larger and larger every day. How do I recommend a publisher deal with that? Uh, because they need that data. And the reason they need that data, by the way, is as a publisher, you need to know how your compositions are being used. You need a list of those sound recordings so you can get paid. The answer is, hire me. That, I'm serious. This is why I created this company. You know, This problem needs to be fixed. I didn't see it in the market. Screw it. I'll go do it. And that's what, part of what we do. I don't have another solution for you. It's, it's kind of like I get hired to do all the horrible stuff. And I will, for the first time, give back to you. Give me one second. What I will do for a, a client of the customer, and any of you can be a client, is when you log in, not only will you see every video in YouTube that is using your music, and by the way, that's the next presentation, but you will also see a list of every commercially released sound recording of your music with direct links to them, with release dates. You, for the first time, will have a window into how your music is being used digitally around the world, and you'll be collecting the money from all of it. And you will be able to download that information and take it and repurpose it abroad. I don't get to participate in that. That's your data. That's your information. And it should unlock money for you abroad. For Jason Mraz, it's unlocked you know, th tens of thousands of euros that he wouldn't have, would have otherwise not gotten as an example. And that's why I exist. Yes? So the question is, what happened with DDEX? So DDEX is a uh, specification format. It's a standard format that is trying to become the thing that everyone uses. Think about it this way. Imagine if, back in the old days when we had CD players, uh, each CD player worked differently than the other. And one CD would only work in this CD player, but not in the other CD player. It would never scale. Same issue with what's called metadata. What, there's trying to create an industry standard that says everyone just do things like this. And that's what DDEX is. It's a way to write machine language and deliver information using an XML feed in a very specific kind of way. It still exists. It's proliferating. It's being adopted and used. It doesn't solve the problem. That problem solves a different problem, which is the standardization of delivery of information. Yes, sir. So the question is, by pro providing the information that you're not required to provide to the third party company to get paid, have, you, have we hurt ourselves or should we put our energy somewhere else? I struggle with that question every day because it's a catch-22. We don't provide the information, we don't get paid, right? And if we do provide the information, we're now doing someone else's work for them without getting compensated to clean up someone else's copyright infringement. It's a, you know, are you hurting yourself? No. But are you doing someone else's job? Yes. Can someone else take your data and then reuse it in a way to make money off of it that you don't get to participate in because they built up a global database? Yes. You know, I, it, again, I try to find the line between the two. There's some places where I've taken a hard line. I'm, you know, I'm, I want to make an example. I'm not going to do your work for you. You are going to sit down at the table. We're going to talk about this or you don't get to use the music in other places right now where I have not taken that hard line. I'm trying to, f I don't want to blow up the industry, I just want to help it work better. So I ultimately, yeah, I struggle with it. I don't have a succinct answer for you. You don't do it, you don't get paid, you do do it, you know. I do think it's worth your while to contemplate, just contemplate, the, uh, the idea of notification of breach of the compulsory license. Or alternatively, work with an organization like mine where I'm the megaphone, you're the voice, 
but I do it for you collectively. So it's not just you all by yourself. It's Metallica, it's Red Hot Chili Peppers, it's all the other clients, and you're part of that. So it's a bigger, uh, bigger leverage, you know, because right now if you're smaller, yeah, we'll take your sound recordings down. Then you're the one getting hurt. But if it's, it's a whole bunch of stuff at once, it's much harder. Plus, I'll absorb legal costs. So. But I do struggle with that. Give me one second. Someone over here who hadn't asked a question. Yes? I don't know, what, so I'm not an attorney, but I do play one on TV. Uh, and I don't know what's required for a class action lawsuit, but I do know that there is massive infringement. And I do know that as an industry, we could do something about it if we chose to. It's a cost-benefit analysis for a lot of people, right? So, Yes, but I, I see, correct. The question is, so we could pull everything, but then we'd be losing out on that income, uh, potentially, and the answer is yes. But I believe that an approach to this is, first of all, it should be done in the spirit of cooperation, I, which is how I try, you know, despite my bombastic personality and what you've heard about me, you know, I don't go in swinging a hatchet. It's like, hey, there's a problem, I'd like to help fix it. Um, if you don't get anywhere, then you have to leverage. You know, then you have to start doing what they, they politely call the Mexican standoff, where, you know, okay, you want to play this game? All right, fine. You're forcing me to do this. You got to give me some weight. You got to have a conversation. So let's get this conversation started. And can you imagine if, you know, a Macham, if um, Seagal, if Big Yellow Dog, if, you know, go through the uh, Hori Pro, Black River, Blue Water, these, these publishers collectively said, you know what? Let's send a letter. Let's all, you know, you know how many compositions that would be? You know how the evergreen songs, these, these songs that matter, you believe me, there would be a conversation. At least we could get the conversation going. So let's sit down at the table and work on this together and figure out what the solution is. Yeah, we'll compromise because we value what we're doing because this is what consumers want and we see that this is where the industry is going, but we gotta have a conversation. Hell, maybe we won't even raise the rate on you right now. Okay, we, I'm not even getting into what the rate is. We're not even getting paid what the rate is. Well, let's just start with that. And so we can ease our way into solving the solution collectively. That, that would be my recommended approach and what I'm trying to do uh, when I do what I do. Yes, sir, in the back. That's true. So the question, the statement was it, you know, there, you can get the playlist of what the CEO is like and, and pull those sound recordings. Yes, you could. Um, part of the other challenge is, and by the way, as food's coming up, I don't mind keep talking during while you eat if you like. So when these lay this out, feel free, I'll keep going. Um, uh, I forgot where I was going with that thread, I'm sorry. But yes, uh, you could do, oh, part of the problem is some entities, and I don't know who, uh, have received advances. All right, so if you're an entity, uh, let's say you're a large, I'm making it up, publishing administrator, they get a very large advance. Uh, you don't really care what happens after that, if the data is good or bad, because you've already been prepaid. As a matter of fact, the data being cleaned up works against you because now you have to pay out royalties on the advance, which otherwise you wouldn't have to. It's called breakage. Right? You, make more, you make more money with the breakage than without. The other challenge is this. The major music companies own over 6% of Spotify, literally own collectively that. They will probably make more money, my guess is, off, if that company does an IPO, they'll probably make more money off the IPO of Spotify than they will off of how much they would have made off the music. Right? It gets an exit, they get their you know, percentage. So let's say $20 billion, 6% of that is whatever the heck that is. Um, there is no exit royalty for artists. You, you don't get a piece of that. Even though the value of Spotify was built off of those copyrights, the people that created the copyrights do not get to participate in the revenue generated from that IPO. So, hey, so what if they're not paying us accurately? I want to build up the value of that company because it gets us an exit, which is worth more than I would have made off of the music, and I don't have to pay royalties out on it. Right? This is, you know, if you look at some of the moves that the Warner Music Group has been making, you kind of wonder if perhaps what they're doing is taking their music catalog and the copyrights they control and using that as leverage to gain equity 
in technology companies like SoundCloud because it's cheaper than spending the money and then when they make it, they don't have to pay royalties out on it. Because they do this a lot. Warner's very progressive. There's your conspiracy theory in regards to that. All right, so, so you know, there is pizza back there and there's gallons of something being wheeled in. Um, please feel free. I'll pound through this in two seconds. Swear to God, swear to gosh, sorry. And um, this is basically what Audium does. And by the way, if you're here for the second session, I'll be doing this again too. But what we do is we get people paid for the digital use of their music. So we're built to get publishers, songwriters, artists, labels paid in this new streaming industry. We work on behalf of publishers, artists, songwriters, labels to get those payments in. And all the stuff I rambled on about is in here. The bottom line is hundreds of millions of dollars have been earned but not paid. There's no infrastructure. They outsourced it. The bad data, no audit clause. It's opaque. It's confusing and difficult to use technology systems. And now you're seeing some screenshots. Right? I mean, this is now old uh, since I made this. We've gotten over 200,000 in streaming mechanicals uh, recovered dating back to 2007. In YouTube, we've got hundreds of thousands in, in escrow back revenue and uh, assuring that our clients get paid on a go-forward basis. And we do it by delivering the, the proper information, finding it, tracking it. Uh, my customers are publishers, songwriters, labels. That's not what I am. I'm not a distributor. I'm not a label. I'm not a publisher. I'm not a publishing administrator. Those are my clients. I'm a technology solution to a horrible problem to allow you to go deal with A&R, culture, pitching. I'll go build the technology systems. I'll collectively fight on your behalf. Yes? Yeah, so I, we, we collect an administration fee. So whatever we're able to collect in, we take an administrative fee, which varies between 15 to 25%. We pay you back monthly. You'll get to see your statements up to 27 places to the right of a decimal point before any rounding happens. They're archived. You can download these statements at will. Uh, a lot of times we'll do 30 days terminate at will at your discretion because I want to prove the value of what we have. There's no post-term collection. You can do a catalog deal, a schedule deal. It's completely up to you. It's incredibly flexible. I want to earn the right to work for you. I want to prove the value. And I want you to think, oh my God, my life just got so much easier. I can go to one place, click a button. I can see everything and get paid on it all. That's what I'm built to do. So going through here. And by the way, you gain access to all the information. I don't hold it hostage. Uh, Finding sound recordings, I talked about that. Updating the metadata, extracting the ISRCs, delivering it out, um, doing what we call post-delivery analysis. By the way, these are, these are real ISRCs of which I think we found 860-something of the uh, composition I'm yours by Jason Mraz. Right? This is a back-end shot into our database which shows all the sort of different metadata fields, delivery reports. Um, it's a lot of information. I try to do top of the trees to make it very simple. But if you want to drill down, you can get as granular as you like and see as much information as you like. It's a lot. I want to normalize. You know, you get these music reports, HFA, MediaNet, RightsFlow statements in along with your YouTube statements. Good luck ingesting those into iMaestro or whatever software you're using. We normalize them all, make it simple so you can view it all. I just take the pain out of this. Fix the bad data, you know. We've created, and I'll get into this too, but we create systems that can tell when something stopped monetizing. How can you fix a problem if you don't know it exists? So you're flagging that and then going in and fixing it, getting rid of the wrong ISRCs and ISWCs. Heck, I've been in databases. I saw Michael Jackson performing Billie Jean, and it got attached to the composition for Pump Up the Jam. Every time that's the performance of that song streamed, the, the publisher for Pump Up the Jam was getting paid. I saw White Christmas, Bing Crosby, got attached to Eric Clapton, White Room. I mean, and it, it goes on, and believe me, I mean, those of you who are, who are publishing administrators in here, again, take a look at your statements. You've all seen it. Why am I getting paid on Motley Crue compositions or whatever it might be? We don't represent that. Oh, this just happens to be a composition of the same name. We don't represent that. You know, this stuff happens constantly. So we track everything, monitor the services, correct ownership, give you your royalty reports. You know, here's an example of a YouTube royalty report top level, down level, you can drill down. What else we got in here? Your payments, oh, we pay monthly direct deposit into your bank account. Then we, I'm gonna, I'll get into the YouTube stuff later. And you can actually, you can see our new dashboards, then when you log in, you get nice little graphs and pretty lights, and you can see uh, your best used compositions, how much money they're generating month to month, some other fun stuff of that. You can see some of the clients. I gotta tell you, by the way, 
I was so proud of TuneCore and still am. I don't like what they've been doing to it because I don't agree with some of the decisions. But I never thought I'd be working with some of these clients. I mean, th this to me is a dream come true for a guy with no talent uh, in the music industry in, in regards to playing music to be able to do things like, you know, House of Hassle represents 10,000 plus compositions for like my favorite indie bands from the 90s. Everything on like Matador, Secretly Canadian, or uh, Fig Music Publishing, which is Epitaph, Pretty Lights, Thomas Dolby, uh, Frankie Valli in the Four Seasons, Steve Vai, Metallica, what are you kidding me? Uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, heck, we do stuff for um, uh, Velvet Apple, which is Dolly Parton. Anyway, so it's just, this is really cool. A Wild Gator, that's Mike Campbell. So a lot of the deals we do is this. We actually created a second version of the site um, called I, the, um, IamMusicPublishing.com, I-A-M-P. We have Audium.com, where anyone can go, and we have the IAMP, which is where larger uh, publishing, publishing administrators can go with sort of different terms and different feature sets. So actually, with all that said, I'm going to be doing this again after the end of the YouTube one. There's 28 pizzas and I think like eight gallons of liquid back there. Uh, please help yourselves, and if you want to come up and approach me during break, please do so, and thank you very much. We'll start again in about mm, 25 minutes to a half an hour.